Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, we are at my computer today and I'm going to be showing you how to make some master dice for tabletop gaming or D&D. Now with that said, I know some of you are probably wondering what happened to the wax carving that we did. Well, don't worry, that's still at the shop. They just had a bit of a malfunction with some of their casting equipment, so we've got to wait a bit of time before they can get things all squared away. Now, I have a pretty severe <laughs> dice addiction, I would say. Um, I have a lot of dice. And with that comes always wanting something more unique, more specific to my characters. So instead of purchasing dice, we're going to try and make some of our own. Now I'm going to be showing you how to make some master dice today before we get started in the mold making process and in the casting process. So with that said, uh, follow along and I will show you what we're going to get up to. Okay, so we're on the computer in Fusion 360 now, and you'll see that I've made a whole bunch of dice on the left hand side. So let's take a look at our D6. This is perhaps the simplest dice that you can make. It's a simple box with some numbers on it. So uh, one way that you can edit these dice is if you click on a surface, you can then right click and go to a drop down menu. Now there's a whole bunch of features in here. Um, when you start, you'd want to use extrude. But right now, if we click the edit feature, we can see the um, height is 15 millimeters, and that's now the, the square of this. Um, if you want to put a number on it, then you'll need to create a sketch, and you can see the different sketches that I've done for each of the faces. So if we click on that now and go to Edit Sketch, you can see that this is sort of um, the way you can uh, make typefaces and that type of thing. Um, one thing that I do want to point out are these little uh, dots here. Those are our centering things and they have been aligned. Now, uh, the way that you can align pieces, uh, you can really do it in a whole bunch of different ways. But the best way I found to center each of these and bind them to this axis is by going over to the top section there and clicking on uh, horizontal slash vertical. So this, this locks them into each other. That way you can't move them. And uh, yeah, that's the best way I found to do that and create uh, lettering and numbering on our boxes. Jumping over to our D12 now. Uh, D12s are my favorite dice. Um, they, I don't know, there's something pleasing about looking at a 12-sided dice. Uh, we can actually go through a play-by-play -play in the bottom here and sort of see how each face is created. So uh, pretty simple, you don't have to do a lot, you can copy and paste a whole bunch and then from there it's all about just uh, getting the numbers in place where you want them. And um, yeah, uh, not super complicated. Zooming in to our D12 now, we're going to take a look at the uh, number depth. Uh, how deep each of these numbers go into the piece. So using our inspect tool, I can click on the different heights and you'll see that the height is 0.62 millimeters. So that's the depth of our numbers. I have tried a whole bunch of different settings for this, like um, half a millimeter, a full millimeter. I think I even went to a millimeter and a half at one point. And uh, this is really what worked best. Now, another thing to note is our number are all opposite each other. This is the way a normal dice is. So the 12 is opposite the 1, the 3 is opposite the 10, the 2 is opposite the 11, and so forth. Um, that is how you create a dice and make sure that it's balanced. Looking at our D4 now, this was actually the hardest dice to make. Not because of the faces, really none of these were all that complicated in terms of face design, but because of the depth of each of our pieces here. So looking at it, it's again 0.62, and this is important because you can see how close these numbers actually get to each other. The depths of them almost uh, align, and in fact when they were a little bit higher up towards the peaks, I actually had this issue. So uh, by orientating them a little bit lower, we can sort of keep them away from each other, that way we don't create holes in our pieces. When all is said and done and you are complete uh, 
that you can go ahead and exit and save each of your files. Now, dropping into each one of these, I load them up into Chitu Box. I prefer to edit each of my dice separately, that way I have saved files. So taking a look at this one here, you can sort of see um, that it is supported individually. Uh, exiting this, we can go and put them all into a file um, just by copying and pasting and that way you've got them to print multiple times if you need to and you can tweak some settings. So these are all of our dice and they have all been supported in different uh, ways. The, the key feature of supporting these dice, as you'll see here, is that they have supports that go along the edge. Now, these are not auto supports. None of these have been supported by auto supports. They're all supported by hand. Looking a bit closer at the numbers, uh, look at the one of the 15 there. You can see that it doesn't need a support, um, even though that edge can get pretty thin, it's all going to be supported by the body of our dice. So you can see that right here. There you go. Very nicely supported, and as we scroll through the layers, you can see how those pieces come together, and that is why this section does not need a support placement. Hopping over slightly to the other side, uh, there you go. You can see that there's an island in the 15. This island is something that needs to be supported. So uh, as we scroll through the layers, you can actually see how large this island can get. And taking a different look at it, you'll see that that whole corner of the 15, if that was not supported, would not be there um, as a resin printer sort of prints up the layers. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we supported this. You'll see that there are three sort of sections and two that come out from it that are unsupported. Um, the reason why I chose not to support those is because as this prints, it's just there to sort of hold it down to the surface of the bed. Um, that way it doesn't detach. Now, when we support our numbers, the higher row, we're gonna have to make sure that there's a space between our um, are supports that connect to those numbers. Otherwise, you're gonna have some problems. The very top surface here, uh, looking at these um, sections of our numbers, they are already supported, despite being at a little bit of a, a steeper angle. So uh, let's just drop down. There you go, you can sort of see that none of these are going to be islands at all. It's all just going to work together. Uh, as soon as you have supported all of your pieces and you're all done, you are ready to jump into your settings. And my settings for my printer are a exposure time of five seconds. This is really important. It's slightly underexposed. The layer height is 0.02 millimeters, and that's what I found worked best for my printer, the Creality LD002R. The resin that I'm using is also any cubic gray, pretty standard, pretty simple. So in these settings, the underexposure is actually fairly important. Um, that way the depth of each of our, oops, okay. Uh, that way the depth of each of our numbers actually gets printed. Um, you basically want to underexpose anything that's gonna have a cavity, that way the cavities appear better. Now, if you're like me and you've got something that's hanging over the edge, that's our D6, you can just go ahead and pull that in and you should be fine to print from there. Uh, just hit slice and then copy that onto your printer and you are good to go. Speaking of resin printing, uh, I figured I'd show you how I do mine. So we're just gonna add some gray anycubic resin to our resin mat and making sure to fill it fairly full. That way we don't run out of resin at any point during this print. Uh, it's always very important guys to wear gloves whenever you're working with resin. In fact, I've got two layers on. That way I am fully protected in case the first one breaks. So uh, with our little thumb drive in, we can go ahead and select our print from the menu. 
that we have saved onto it and we can start our print. So I've got this sped up just a little bit for you, that way you can see the head go down and the print begin to start. As a note, I know I'm by a window, but this is a box I keep my printer in. It is also hooked up to the window, that way it can vent air to the outside and I can monitor my print going. Um, this is actually a wooden box, it's not made of cardboard. So with our print finished, it took about six hours to do. Uh, we can remove our top and try and avoid getting as much light as possible onto these prints. So uh, unscrewing the top, we'll pull that off and set it to the side. And I've got a little wall set up and I'm trying to block as much of the light as possible. I use a paint scraper to crack these off the base there. And it's fairly simple actually. I don't know why everyone has so much problems with it, but uh, I just clean this up, getting it ready for my next print. And this is actually the only step that I use isopropyl alcohol on. Um, I'm just paying attention to being sure that the surface is clean and clear for the next time I print something. These guys are in a bath of mean green and I'm using a ultra soft toothbrush just to clean them up, trying to get into all the little parts and then it's into the ultrasonic cleaner. Now I usually leave it in there for two cycles of eight minutes and when it's done, I break the bases off. Now, unfortunately, I lost all the footage of that, so let's just go ahead and recreate that here. Um, the D20 was on there, and then all the pieces sort of came off, and I cut them off using a flush cut pair of uh, pliers there. So uh, let's just show you how I did this. There you go, nice and clean. <laughs> And uh, they go back into the water, getting ready to uh, get brushed one more time, making sure that all those little uh, indentations are clean and clear. And then it's into the uh, UV curing area. So I've got a little box with a UV curing light on top and we'll just stick that in there, making sure all of our numbers are up to one side. That way we know what the opposite one should be. So our prints are finally done and this is what they looked like after a couple days in the sun. And with that, they are ready to be sanded. So we're going to clean up all of those faces. I've got some Zona paper here, uh, which is a 3M wet dry sandpaper. And this one is 30 microns and we're going to take this all the way up to one micron, which is basically a polishing paper. So I've got it on a piece of glass on a potter's wheel and we're just gonna go ahead and drop our pieces onto it, being very careful not to nick any of the edges. And we're also being sure that we consistently check our piece, that way we don't remove too much material, especially on the 30 grit. As we go along, we're all the way up to the one micron grit now. This is a polishing paper and I typically leave it on there for about eight seconds or so that way we can really be sure that we're getting a clean surface and there you are look at how shiny all of these are uh, particularly that eight face okay we are all done for the day that concludes another cold day in the workshop our clickety clacks are looking nice and shiny and they are ready to go for some vacuum casting now we'll be making some master molds next time so stay tuned for that and uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, once again, if there's anything you'd like to see made, please write it down in the comments, and I will see you next time. Bye, guys.